All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the next instalment of the Centre for English Legal History seminar series. Firstly, just a couple of brief notifications. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that this is being recorded by Microsoft Teams and will be uploaded to the Centre's YouTube channel following the presentation. And secondly, as usual, we're planning to have, head to the Granta pub after the seminar for some drinks and or dinner. Professor Lobin has very kindly uh, agreed to join us and you're all very welcome to come along. So this evening, we're delighted to have Professor Michael Lobin presenting to us. Professor Lobin is currently Professor of Legal History at the University of Oxford, a Senior Research Fellow at All Souls College and Secretary of the Selden Society. He obtained his undergrad degree and his PhD here at the University of Cambridge and has held teaching and research positions at University of Durham, Brunel University, Queen Mary University of London and the London School of Economics. He has published widely on the history of law and legal thought in the common law world in the early modern and modern periods and is the author of works including The Common Law and English Jurisprudence 1760 to 1850, A History of the Philosophy of Law in the Common Law World 1600 to 1900 and Imperial Incarceration, Detention Without Trial in the Making of British Colonial Africa. Today, he will be presenting on the Troubles of Treason, an exploration of law of treason in the 19th century British Empire. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lobin. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for that very kind uh, introduction. Thank you for the very kind uh, invitation. Uh, Delighted to see you uh, in the room. Delighted to see so many also online from uh, far afield uh, and close by. The law of treason has attracted a good deal of attention in recent years. Much, as it, much, much of it is focused on the fact that the basis of the law remains a statute from 1351, which codified the medieval law of treason. At the heart of the offence is the betrayal of one's allegiance to the king. The statute defines three particularly central manifestations of treason, compassing and imagining the death of the king, uh, levying war against the king in his realm, and giving aid and comfort to the king's enemies, either in his realm or elsewhere. A number of modern critics have argued that what they call the obscure and difficult language of the statute makes it hard to apply to contemporary situations and have called for reform of the law to modernize it. While many are critical uh, of the uh, ancient law, there's little agreement on what should be done. In its 1977 report, the Law Commission, which saw treason primarily as a wartime offense, recommended removing the link of treachery to allegiance. In another report in 2008, the Law Commission further questioned the need for a law of treason in peacetime given that offences such as terrorism are better dealt with uh, by uh, other means. By contrast, in uh, 2018, Policy Exchange published a pamphlet entitled Aiding the Enemy, How and Why to Restore the Law of Treason. Though critical of the ancient law, the authors of that pamphlet don't want to see it abolished in peacetime, they rather want to repurpose it. And the cover of the pamphlet, as you can see here, vividly illustrates the object of their concern, showing a hooded man in black uh, brandishing a knife at the viewer. It's obviously aimed to call in mind uh, organizations such as uh, Daesh. The pamphlet argues that the law relating to terrorist offenses is insufficient to deal with Britons who go abroad to join such groups for two reasons. First, terrorism offenses fail to recognize the wrongfulness of the crime committed which uh, consists in the betrayal of one's country, the breach of a duty of loyalty on which the social order depends. Secondly, they argue the sentences given are too light. So the pamphlet is attracted by the very features of treason which earlier critics have, uh, have attacked. Uh, that is that it should be based on a bond of loyalty or allegiance and that it should carry uh, a severe uh, punishment. Critics tend to focus on the 1351 Act and uh, often ignore the 1848 Treason Felony Act. Under this statute, a term of life imprisonment can be opposed uh, on people uh, who compass, 
imagine, invent, devise or intend to deprive or depose the Queen uh, or her heirs of the style, honour or royal name of the Crown, uh, who conspire to levy war, to force or constrain uh, the Crown to change uh, its measures, uh, or to conspire to move any stranger with force uh, to attack any of Her Majesty's uh, dominions. Uh, although ignored by the authors of the policy exchange pamphlet, this act has caused some debate uh, elsewhere. In 2002, Alan Rusbridger and Polly Toynbee, respectively editor and columnist for The Guardian, sought to uh, obtain a, a declaration that the operative part of the 1848 Act, that's to say Section 3, was incompatible with the Human Rights Act, since the wording appears to make it treasonable to write articles in the press uh, peacefully advocating the abolition of the monarchy. Although the application uh, by Rusbridger uh, and uh, Toynbee was dismissed, Lord Steyne described the clause uh, of the statute in question as a relic of a bygone age, which does not fit into the fabric of our modern legal system. As he saw it, the primary purpose of the statute had been to target newspaper editors, and it had remained unused, he said, since 1883. He added that the idea that it could survive scrutiny under the Human Rights Act is unreal. Such comments seem to suggest that the English law of treason is unworkable, uh, archaic and in need of reform. The 1381 Act is often seen as unusable because it's too narrow and restrictive in its formulation. The 1848 Act is seen as being too broad to be applied in practice. Uh, however, a historical examination uh, of the evolution of the law of treason in Britain and its empire from the 18th century to the 20th reveals that the law often showed itself to be flexible and adaptable. Within Britain, there were attempts to rein in the reach of the medieval statute, which had expanded in the early modern era to cover a wide range of so-called constructive treasons so that the 1381, uh, 1351 Act would remain the prime legal tool to be used in times of war. The legislation of 1848 was developed to provide a lesser penalty for political treasons to allow the prosecution not of newspaper editors seeking constitutional reform, but of Irish Republicans wishing to obtain a change of government by force. This was to adapt the law of treason in a changing political society in which the franchise was expanding and space was increasingly allowed to political protest, at least of a non-violent kind. However, the law of treason was not limited to England. In, a range, uh, in an age of imperial expansion, questions were asked about what constituted treason beyond metropolitan shores. Both the medieval and Victorian statutes were applied elsewhere in the empire, but the way they were applied and the meanings attributed to them could vary according to context. Furthermore, the substantive law of treason might be the same across many parts of the empire uh, uh, as London sought to implement a consistent uh, law. Uh, but the constitutional arrangements of the 19th century empire also allowed for local variations, which might remove procedural guarantees put in place in 17th century England. At the same time, imperial policy also allowed for a variation of the laws of treason in the empire uh, and uh, even an overlapping multiplicity of laws. So if the English concept of treason could be exported into new areas, sometimes in adapted forms, uh, it was also open to be influenced by juridical learning on the laws of other systems, which might in turn come back and influence the domestic law. So I want to start by looking uh, at the law uh, in, uh, in England uh, before moving to the empire. Although the medieval statute defined treason quite narrowly, in essence, plotting to kill the king or levying actual war against him, its reach had expanded by the late 18th century through the development of a number of constructive treasons. Early modern authorities stated that defendants could be guilty of compassing and imagining the death of the king, not only if they plotted to kill him, but also if they conspired to depose him or to imprison him until he yielded to certain demands. The charge of compassing and imagining the death of the king was also extended by other constructions. Under the wording of the act, a conspiracy to levy war or rebellion was not in itself treason. However, 
there was authority that uh, a conspiracy to rebel or levy war could count as an overt act of compassing or imagining the death of the king. Henry Hallam said that this doctrine had been recognized first in 1663, and as he put it, had, uh, has been repeatedly laid down from the bench in subsequent proceedings for treason, although he himself thought the doctrine was utterly irreconcilable with any fair interpretation of the statute. So that's uh, compassing and imagining the death of the king, but the treason of levying war against the king also had been extended by constructions. As a result of some early modern cases, it included not uh, merely resorting to arms in the manner that a foreign, foreign enemy might, but also any general armed attack directed against royal authority. As Sir Michael Foster explained, insurrections uh, to effect changes of a public and general concern, such as the throwing down of all enclosures, were regarded as constructive levying of war since their public nature meant that they were targeted against his royal majesty and had a tendency to dissolve the bonds of society. By contrast, where those embroiled in a private quarrel took up arms, as where weavers armed themselves to destroy the looms of those who undercut their prices, that did not count as constructive treason because it didn't have that kind of public dimension. Such was the view of treason uh, when the leaders of the London Corresponding Society were prosecuted for the offence in 1794. The indictment against them was clearly framed as a constructive compassing and imagining the king's death. They were charged with conspiring to incite rebellion and war against the king, to subvert the legislature and government, and to depose the king from his royal state, and thereby to put him to death. The overt acts by which the treason was to be proved were primarily the organization of a convention in which delegates from all over the country would meet and call for political reform. In effect, this was an attempt by the Crown to use the ancient law of treason to criminalize a political reform movement during the era of the French Revolution. Defending the accused, Thomas Erskine focused carefully on the words of the statute telling the jury that they should only convict if it was clear that the defendants in, intended to endanger the king's life. His rhetoric persuaded the jury, who were not convinced that the London Corresponding Society's political activity would lead to George III ending in the grave. Erskine's victory was much celebrated, uh, and many assumed that he had buried the doctrine of constructive treason when it came to compassing and imagining the king's death. Uh, and the British state would not again use a treason charge in this way to discredit a mass movement with this kind of general uh, trial. Uh, but the doctrine was in many ways made redundant in 1795 with the passing of the Treasonable Practices Act. This act made it treason uh, to conspire to deprive the king of his kingly position in any of his dominions. It also made it treason to conspire to levy war or insurrection in order to compel him to change his councils or to overawe parliament. Those convicted under the act would suffer the same penalties as those tried under the 1351 act. The act was uh, unpopular, as you can see from the cartoon there. Uh, it was seen as oppressive precisely because it made, uh, it explicitly made conspiracies against the government treasonable. Initially temporary, it was made permanent in uh, 1817. Uh, and then, of course, uh, 30 years later, in 1848, we have the passing of the Treason Felony Act. This act was passed in the context of growing unrest in Ireland. As the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, pointed out, while those who incited people to uh, treason in England could be prosecuted under the 1795 Act, that act was not thought to extend to Ireland. One, act, one aim of the act was therefore to apply to Ireland, the kind of prevent, uh, provisions relating to political treasons which had been introduced in England in 1795. But another aim was to remove the death penalty associated with treason from the political treasons and to impose the lesser penalties of uh, imprisonment associated with felony. The Act itself repealed the 1795 Act except those parts which had been specifically included to protect the personal safety of the King's uh, heirs and successors, which were now extended to Ireland. 
So the political treasons under that legislation were now reenacted as felonies. Uh, and the wording uh, of Section 3 that Lord Steyn disliked uh, so much, uh, in effect, reproduced the 1795 Act. This is that act coming uh, back and made uh, to extend to Ireland. So as a result of this legislation, there were in effect three branches of treason in the mid 19th century in England. The first branch aimed to protect the, uh, the personal integrity of the monarch. This was secured both by the 1351 Act, which continued to be in force, and by other legislation passed in the interval, such as the Treason Act of 1842, which imposed a non-capital penalty for those who attempted to injure or alarm the monarch, such as by pointing weapons at her. That's the one most recently used, if you've been following the press. Uh, the second branch, also found in the 1351 Act, related to the capital treason of levying war or adhering to the king's enemies. The third branch, which related to the more political treasons of conspiring to levy war or insurrection or overawe the government, was a non-capital felony under the 1848 Act. So where did this leave constructive treason? In the decade before the 1848 Act passed, there had been much discussion of the ambit of the law of treason by commissioners appointed to codify or consolidate the criminal law. The commissioners were aware that as a matter of law, the doctrine of constructive treason had, been, uh, had not been undermined by Erskine's successful defense of the treason trialists, but had been reaffirmed by judges and jurists. The commissioners were highly critical of the doctrine of constructive treason, whether in the form of constructive compassing of the king's death or levying of war. In their view, these constructions had been rendered unnecessary by the 1795 Act, and so they proposed to define the term compassing and imagining the king's death as signifying, as they put it, an actual intention to kill. They also wanted to uh, uh, the, the term levying war to be understood in its literal sense, uh, getting rid of constructions altogether. Given that the 1848 Act, however, left the 1351 Act intact, and given that no consolidating or codifying legislation was passed along the lines suggested by the criminal law commissioners, it remained theoretically possible to prosecute for the old constructive treasons under the 1351 Act. But in practice, no prosecution for such constructive treasons uh, were brought in England again. And this was primarily because the Treason Felony Act was sufficient to deal with those uh, who subverted the state. In the United Kingdom, this charge, as I've mentioned, was primarily used against Irish Republicans uh, for whom it had been designed. A decision of the House of Lords in 1868 showed that the act was broad enough to criminalize membership of an organization aiming to subvert the state. Dennis Mulcahy and five others were accused of compassing the deposition of the queen and conspiring to levy war because of their membership of the Fenian Brotherhood, confirming that they could be convicted under the legislation without any proof of overt acts beyond conspiring. Justice Willis ruled the very plot is an act in itself. The Treason Felony Act was thus suitable to deal with any plots to undermine the state uh, by means of force. While the 1848 Act was used for internal challenges to the authority of the state, uh, at least until terrorism legislation took its place and it carries on uh, right the way uh, into the later 20th century, the 1351 Act would be used in England only to prosecute traitors in times of war for levying war against the king or adhering to his enemies. In the early 20th century, two cases against uh, two Irishmen who'd, been, who'd given aid to the monarch's enemies abroad established the extraterritorial reach of the medieval statute. The first case concerned Arthur Lynch, who went to South Africa in 1900 as a war correspondent for a French newspaper. Soon after arriving in Pretoria, he swore an oath of allegiance to the South African Republic and then led an Irish brigade which fought on the Boer side in the war between March and May 1900. In 1902, having been elected in his absence as an MP for Galway, uh, Lynch returned to Britain to take up his seat. And as soon as he got off the boat 
uh, at New Haven, he was arrested for high treason. Charged under the 1351 Act, his defense was that the indictment did not disclose any offense. Focusing on the words of the statute, his lawyers argued that adhering to the king's enemies outside the realm was no treason. The argument was rejected by Chief Justice Olverstone, who held that although under the 1351 statute it was only treason for a subject to levy war against the king within his realm, it was treason to adhere to the king's enemies or aid them elsewhere. The case confirmed that the clauses of the 1351 Act relating to uh, adhering to the king's enemies had an extraterritorial reach so that anyone accused of these offences could be tried in England for them. Uh, and in fact, there was a very uh, eloquent uh, sentence uh, pronounced against him, stressing all the things of loyalty and so on that uh, uh, recent commentators would like to see as part of the law of treason. Uh, a decade later, a more famous Irishman, Sir Roger Casement, was executed, also in line with this view for uh, assisting the king's enemies uh, abroad. So much for the law in England. Let's turn now to the common law, what I call the common law empire. The arguments in Lynch and Casement raised a question which had been discussed previously elsewhere in the British Empire. Did the same law apply to the king's subjects wherever they lived, or were there local variations? The reach of the medieval statute was discussed in the 1790s in two cases from uh, Ireland and Canada. In 1798, Henry and John Shears, members of the United Irishmen, were charged with compassing the death of the king by conspiring to stir up rebellion, depose the king, and overturn the government of the country by force. The 1351 statute applied in Ireland by virtue of Poyning's Law of 1494, which introduced all existing English law for, pu for the public weal in Ireland. But questions remained over its operation. Following Erskine's example, their lawyer, George Ponsonby, argued that the defendants had to be shown to have intended the king's physical death. Uh, Ponsonby conceded that it was possible to argue for a constructive law of treason in England, uh, since an attempt to force the king to change his measures might lead to his death there. He might resist until the moment that he was killed. <clears throat> but he argued that there could be no presumption of the king's own life being in danger as a result of rebellious activities in Ireland, because the king never came to Ireland. He was never there. The argument cut no ice with the judge, Lord Carlton, who reiterated the view of constructive treason, which Chief Justice Eyre had uh, set out in the London Corresponding Society case. Uh, um, he rejected the idea that the king's non-residence in Ireland made any difference. Similar argument, uh, was attempted in the first North American treason trial, that of David McLean. He was tried in 1797 in Quebec City, charged under the 1351 Act, both with compassing and imagining the death of the king and with adhering to the king's enemies. Now, there's plenty of evidence to convict him on the second count, but the question of whether he could be convicted for a constructive compassing of the king's death uh, in Canada was raised in a motion in arrest of judgment when his lawyer, George Pike, argued that the 1351 statute was a local one limited to the realm of England uh, and couldn't be applied in Canada. That argument was rejected by Chief Justice uh, Osgood, uh, who held that uh, by virtue of the Quebec Act of 1774, all English law applied uh, in Canada as well. Uh, he also held that the offense of compassing the death of the king was not confined to plots hatched in England. And uh, as in the Irish case, uh, he accepted the uh, constructive view of treason, uh, as the court put it there, that the king is partly a natural, partly a political character, and that to aim at the destruction of the one or of the other constitutes the crime of high treason. If the doctrine of constructive treason was of diminishing importance in the metropolis after 1795, it remained central uh, in the colonies. In the mid 19th century, British colonial administrators were inc increasingly keen to develop a consistent law of treason in the empire. But it was not always clear to them how much of English law actually applied in the colonies uh, and which colonies it applied to. Uh, 
1837, in the aftermath of the abolition of slavery, when the law codes of slave colonies needed revision, a circular letter was sent to governors of various colonies in the West Indies, asking them to report on how the law in their colonies differed from English law and particularly in respect of treason. Many colonies such as Antigua, uh, Nevis and Tortola responded that the law which applied was either the common law or the English statutes or the law of England at the time of the settlement. Some such as Jamaica reported that they had their own treason law which went further than the 1351 statute which in effect um, mimicked the 1795 one. Uh, others such as St Lucia still retained the law of earlier colonial powers, in this case the French law. In response to these returns London made it clear that it wanted the local laws to follow the English model, and in 1851, St. Lucia passed uh, legislation to assimilate its law of treason to that of England. Other colonies do the same thing. Uh, in the second half of the century, the colonial office was also keen to export the Treason Felony Act to its, to its colonies, since there were doubts, uh, at least in some places, whether this legislation applied outside the metropolis uh, or not. In 1867, a circular letter was therefore sent to colonial governors asking them to pass legislation on the lines of that uh, act. Uh, and measures were accordingly passed uh, in many places in the West Indies, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and Natal. And you have examples there uh, on the overhead. The idea <clears throat> that there could be a consistent imperial law can also be glimpsed from the treason trial of uh, five Maori defendants who were charged in 1869 in the aftermath of Takuti's war in New Zealand. Although they could have been charged under the new 1868 uh, Act, the local variant of the 1848 one, they were in fact charged under the 1351 statute, uh, which was seen as uh, applicable when someone who took up arms against the Crown. Justice Johnson's charged the grand jury in this case, which was a detailed exposition of the old English cases and authorities on the statute uh, uh, of 1351, showed a clear view that the law of treason was an imperial one, could be used against Maori just as well as against anyone else. At the same time, the application of the law of treason could vary significantly in the colonial context. One difference can be seen in how common legislation was understood uh, and applied. As we've seen by the 1880s, the Treason Felony Act was used in England primarily against Irish Republicans for organizing bombing campaigns. In the same decade, the, British, uh, the, the colony of British Honduras saw its first treason trial under the Treason Felony Act. In July 1882, Manuel Jesus Castillo, a wealthy timber logger of Spanish descent who lived on the frontier land between British Honduras and Yucatan, was prosecuted on suspicion of encouraging uh, a local Ikaiche Maya leader to question where the border lay between British territory uh, and Mexico. Castillo was charged with a conspiracy to levy insurrection and to incite foreigners to invade. The overt acts proving the conspiracy were the publication and distribution of copies of 18th century treaties between Britain and Spain uh, to induce the belief that the border was more in the Mexican favor than in the British favor. In his summing up, the Chief Justice of the colony told the jury that even if the treaties showed that the territory in question was Mexican, it would be an offense to publicize this fact with the intention charged uh, under the uh, indictment. Castillo's conviction shows the elasticity of the charge of treason felony in the margins of empire, where a conspiracy to depose the crown might be inferred from very, very slender evidence. There was also a second difference uh, in the colonial experience. For the procedures enshrined, particularly in the 1696 Treason Trials Act uh, in England and later English legislation, might not apply elsewhere. This became evident in the Irish high treason case of William Smith O'Brien in 1849, after the Treason Felony Act had been passed, long after the Act of Union. 
O'Brien, leader of the Young Irelanders Irish Confederation, was charged in Dublin under the 1351 Act with levying war against the Queen as a result of a rebellious outbreak in Tipperary. After he was convicted and sentenced to death, O'Brien sought a writ of error, one of the grounds of which was that he'd not been given a copy of the indictment and a list of witnesses 10 days before the trial, as was required by the 1696 Act. His challenge failed. Uh, Chief Justice Blackburn held that the protection given to defendants by this English legislation just didn't apply to Ireland. It was English legislation, not Irish legislation. This approach uh, was reaffirmed in the 1885 Canadian trial of the Métis leader Louis Riol for his leading role in the Northwest Rebellion. Charged under the 1351 Act for levying war, he was tried under the provisions of the Canadian Northwest Territories Act of 1880, which gave uh, criminal jurisdiction to stipendiary magistrates sitting with a jury of six. Riel's lawyers objected at the trial to a capital offence being tried under this procedure, and after his conviction, uh, he appealed first to the Queen's Bench in Manitoba and then to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Riel's lawyers argued that the Crown had no power to try him under the Northwest Territories Act of 1880. They claimed that the Canadian Parliament only had a delegated power which could not take away rights derived from Magna Carta or the old English statutes. They regarded treason as an imperial matter and contended that uh, the Canadian legislature could not pass legislation inconsistent with imperial law. The argument cut little ice either in Manitoba or in uh, Downing Street. Both courts held that by virtue of imperial legislation, the Canadian power, uh, parliament rather, had plenary powers to make law for the peace, order and good governance of the territories in which the offence had taken place. Given the line of statutory authority from Westminster via Ottawa, there seemed no room for any argument that the local law relating to procedure was ultra vires. Delivering the judgment of the Privy Council, Lord uh, Halsbury, the Lord Chancellor, made a significant comparison. He noted that the Canadian statute had, quote, uh, word, had used words uh, under which the widest departure from criminal procedure as it is known and practiced in this country have been authorized in Her Majesty's Indian Empire. Making a comparison between what happened in India and what powers could apply in a settler colony. In looking to India, Halsby looked to a jurisdiction where the legislature had not only created its own procedures, however, but one where the law relating to offences against the state, whose definition might have been influenced by English reformist ideas, had begun to develop uh, in a different direction. And it is to India that we now turn. In the jurisdictions discussed so far, an argument could be made that there was a common substantive law of treason while there were local variations in procedures used in trials. But in India, matters were much more complicated given the nature of British jurisdiction there. Uh, India was not a conquered or settled colony. Uh, until 1858, British rule in India was administered by the East India Company, whose initial right to govern derived not from Her Majesty's government, but from the grant given by the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II in 1765 of the Diwani, or right to collect taxes in Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. While British subjects resident in the presidency towns where Supreme Courts had been set up were liable to be tried for their offences under English law, anyone outside those towns in the so-called Mufusil um, were not subject to English law, but uh, to a criminal law which was still the Islamic law of the Mughal Empire. The likelihood of British subjects falling foul of the medieval statute of treason in Calcutta or Bombay uh, was very small indeed. Uh, but a bigger concern was how to deal with Indians who might take up arms against the company. Uh, and the problem uh, uh, can be seen uh, in the case of Shams uh, Adola and Mirza Jan Tupish, uh, who were tried in Calcutta in 17. 99 for an offence called treason against the state. They were accused of entering into a traitorous correspondence with other Indian princes to plot an uprising against British rule in Bengal. They were tried under Islamic law in which the court was guided by a fatwa from two Muslim law officers. 
the men were convicted, but as it turned out, Islamic law did not provide for any exemplary punishment for traitors. It only provided that traitors be imprisoned until they repented. This troubled uh, the governor general, Richard Wellesley, very much indeed. Uh, he felt that the sentence imposed on these men was altogether disproportionate to the crimes of which they had been convicted. He therefore asked for a regulation to be drafted, quote, for the trial of persons charged with crimes against the state framed in conformity to the principles of the English law of treason, as far as that law might appear to be applicable to the circumstances of British government in India, unquote. Although a measure was drawn up, it was not passed. Instead, Regulation 10 of 1804, the Bengal State's Offences Regulation, was passed. This empowered the government to declare martial law in any area where people took up arms or aided the enemy and to direct the immediate trial by courts martial of all persons owing allegiance to the British government, either in consequence of their having been born in or of their being resident uh, in uh, those territories or under its protection. In Bengal, offences against the state would be dealt with by legislation giving the government exceptional powers. They also included the famous um, uh, power in 1818, Regulation 3, which allowed for the detention for reasons of state of individuals against whom there were no grounds for or not sufficient grounds for judicial proceedings. This emergency legislation did not speak the language of allegiance to the crown, nor of the need to protect the body of the English king, who was not, after all, monarch in India. This can also be seen from uh, Bombay's Regulation 14, passed in 1827, to, pass, uh, to define crimes and punishments within that presidency. Under Section 12, it was treason uh, to raise armed men for the purpose of making war against any of the British governments in India or the adjacent countries. This was uh, a definition of political crime tailor-made for Indian conditions and which at that stage had very little to do with English law. However, the subject was revisited uh, by Macaulay's Indian Law Commission, which considered the matter in the 1830s. The commission was set up under the Charter Act of 1833, which also appointed a governor general and council with power to legislate for India. The powers of this body were limited in one significant way, for it was not empowered to pass any law which would interfere with the laws of the United Kingdom relating to allegiance to the Crown. With this in mind, when Macaulay came to draft a penal code for India and considered how to deal with offences against the state, he concluded that he had no power to legislate for offences against any power but the government of India. Uh, since any attempt to define the crime of treason or any punishment for it more broadly would stray into that forbidden territory. In his notes to the draft code, Macaulay doubted whether the medieval English statute bound, as he put it, a native of India in the Mufusil. He therefore recommended imperial legislation to extend the English law of treason to India, since it was not unlikely that persons re residing in the territories of the East India Company may be parties to the levying of war against the British Crown without violating any local regulation. The draft code itself showed signs of being influenced by English law. It included a provision that whoever wages war against the government of any part of the territories of the East India Company or attempts to wage such war uh, or by instigation, conspiracy or aid uh, abets the waging of such war shall be punished with death. This in effect combined both the levying of war provisions found in the Medieval English Act and the conspiracy uh, notion in the 1795 Act. Uh, a further provision parallel to the political offences defined in 1795 in England made it an offence to overawe or restrain members of the government. The code had not been passed by the time the 1857 rebellion broke out. And in dealing with the rebels, the British authorities relied on martial law courts created by legislation passed in the aftermath of the revolt, which built on earlier martial law legislation. Those tried under this uh, set of statutes included the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah II, 
The fact that the English concept of allegiance did not underpin its view of state offences in India at this stage is demonstrated by the fact that the military tribunal felt at ease in putting on trial the very sovereign uh, from whom the East India Company's own powers were meant to be derived. But it had statutory authority to do so. The Indian Penal Code itself was finally uh, enacted in 1860, two years after company rule in India was replaced by the Crown. It did not explicitly use the language of treason, but had a chapter on offences against the state. Section 121 of the Code enacted that whoever waged war against the Queen or abetted the waging of war was punishable with death or transportation for life. That it was intended to have imperial reach beyond the shores of India, which the 1837 draft did not have, was shown by one of the explanatory uh, illustrations, which stated that a person in India who abetted a rebellion in Ceylon by sending weapons there would be guilty uh, under the section. Unlike the 1837 draft, the Codas passed did not include a provision relating to conspiracies to, to wage war. And legislation in 1870 amended this by providing that anyone who conspired to wage war or to deprive the Queen of the sovereignty uh, of India or to overawe its government by force was liable to life transportation. This was introduced by the law member of the Viceroy's Council, James Fitzjames Stephen. It was specifically modelled on the 1848 English Act, and it was done so to fill a gap which Stephen feared might be filled by judges making the kind of constructive interpretations of treason that uh, the English jurists at that stage wanted to remove from uh, English law. In interpreting the meaning of waging war in this uh, section of the Indian Penal Code, commentators looked to the meanings uh, attributed to the English phrase levying war. So the interpretation of the Indian Code is shaped by the English interpretations of levying war under the 1351 statute. The Indian law commissioners, like their English counterparts, were of the view that both phrases were unambiguous when stripped of constructive interpretations and connoted the kind of hostile challenge which an uh, invading foreign enemy might present. But by the end of the 19th century, by which time British rule in India was coming under pressure from a growing nationalist movement, some commentators began to disagree. In his 1896 treatise, John D. Main thought that the commissioners, the Indian law commissioners, had failed to see uh, an important distinction between international wars, where a literal meaning of levying war might safely be applied, and what he called social wars or rebellions where it could not. As he explained, insurrections often began with a mere local disturbance, which might then grow into a full rebellion. Main thought the distinction which underpinned the notion of constructive levying of war was a good one. To distinguish between a mere riot and a rebellion, one had to look at the object with which it is started. So the example he gave was this. If uh, Hindus uh, who were rioting against Muslims who were killing cows resisted the military, that would not constitute waging war. But if they rioted to induce the government to pass legislation uh, banning the killing of cows, that would be levying war. By applying the constructive interpretation of the English offence of levying war to section 121 of the code, Indian judges and jurists were able to apply a constructive interpretation that any violent gathering with an object of a public nature which struck against government authority constituted waging war. And although the medieval statute would not be used in England to prosecute for subversive political activities, the equivalent legislation in India was used to such effect. In India, the moribund constructive treasons came to life so that those who took part in mob protests aimed at the subversion of British power, such as those who supported the Caliphate movement at the end of the First World War, could be convicted of levying war. As in Canada and Ireland, uh, the argument that English procedural protections should apply in India also failed. In the case of 1870, arising from the Wahhabi conspiracy, which generated <clears throat> a number of political trials in the 1860s, it was argued that all of the offences had occurred more than three years before the charges were laid. 
And according to the English 1696 Treason Trials Act, it was now too late to bring the charges. The argument was made that the English law of treason applied in India unless repealed. But it was an argument easily dismissed by Justice Norman with the point that the defendants were not charged with treason, they were charged with an offence under the Indian Penal Code. So if the interpretation of the Indian Penal Code was to be influenced by English laws of treason, the English law of treason itself was held to have no application and its protections did not apply either. In 19th century uh, India, the British recast the law of treason for an imperial context. First developed in the 1830s before British India was under the formal rule of the crown, it sought to adapt English uh, ideas of treason in a way which would protect a government rather than a monarch. Although the 1860 code substituted the queen for the government, the code did not include any provisions derived from the 1351 statute to protect the person of the monarch. The old feudal idea of allegiance to the king, which underpinned the English statute, were missing from this legislation. The code sought to criminalize acts designed to endanger the state without worrying too much about concepts of allegiance or loyalty. On occasion, Indian defendants sought to invoke the notion of allegiance to secure procedural protections when held uh, for offences against the state, but without success. Amir Khan, who challenged his detention under Regulation 3 of 1818, and Barindra Kumar Ghosh, who challenged his trial without a jury in, 18, in 1909, both invoked the Charter Act, which I've already mentioned, which limited the power of the government of India to legislate on matters uh, relating to allegiance owed to the crown. You couldn't interfere with crown allegiance. Their argument was that as allegiance and protection were reciprocally due from subject and sovereign, any attempt by uh, the legislature to take away the protection the sovereign gave, such as by removing the right to a jury, would have the effect of relaxing the duty of allegiance. Uh, and therefore, under the Charter Act, the ultra-virus, it would somehow intervene, interfere with the uh, protection. Argument got absolutely nowhere. Uh, they just beat it out of court to say it has nothing to do with what we're dealing with here. My final venue is uh, another jurisdiction. Uh, we turn now to Southern Africa. In the areas discussed so far, the applicable law of treason was either English law or a local variant in some way modelled on it. However, in the conflict which saw by far the largest number of treason trials, the Anglo-Boer War of 1899 to 1902, the law which applied was a local law which differed in significant ways from the English. The law which applied in the Cape and in neighbouring Natal was the Roman Dutch law which had applied in the Cape before it was uh, acquired by the British Crown during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it was not immediately apparent that Roman Dutch law would be retained. Commissioners appointed in the 1820s recommended the introduction of English law, but the colonial office urged caution, fearing that the introduction of English law might undermine settled rules of property. As for criminal law, the commissioners realized that the principal difference between the two, dif uh, two systems consisted not in the definition of crimes, but in the punishment awarded, uh, and there was no appetite to, to bring the as yet unrepealed bloody code uh, to Southern Africa. In the Cape, Roman Dutch law therefore remained the common law by default simply because it was never repealed. In Natal, by contrast, uh, it rested on statutory foundations being introduced by ordinance in 1845. There were some changes. When the Cape Supreme Court was set up in 1827, a criminal jury was introduced, and it would remain to be seen whether the Cape, like Quebec, would retain a civil law system based on Roman Dutch law and a criminal system based on common law, or whether it would retain a Roman Dutch criminal law. Uh, it also uh, remained a, an open question what the uh, offences against the Crown would be. The question of which law applied in treason cases was raised in the first treason trial to be heard before the Cape uh, Court of Justice. Uh, Andres Burta, who you see here, was tried for treason in the aftermath of the Cat River Rebellion of 1851. He was charged with high treason for levying war and uh, insurrection against the Queen, contrary to his duty of allegiance, language in the charges which reflected the 1351 Act. 
At his trial, a procedural objection was raised by his counsel, who invoked rights given to English defendants under a statute of Anne. The objection was overruled because it actually had been made too late. It wouldn't have floated uh, in England. But during the discussion, Chief Justice Wilde asked the Attorney General, William Porter, to consider whether treason can vary in any part of the British dominions. Porter's response was that English law determines what is the sovereign, but in a colony, the law of the colony determines what are the functions and powers of the crown. By 1868, the Natal legislature appeared to affirm that the underlying basis of treason in South Africa, or in Natal at least, was Roman Dutch. In that year, as we've seen, uh, legislation was passed to implement the 1848 Treason Felony Act in response to the colonial office's direction. But whereas the British statute uh, had a saving provision uh, which stated that nothing in it should affect the operation of the 1351 statute, the equivalent clause in Natal's version preserved the Roman Dutch uh, crimen peduelionis, which you can see there in the bottom corner. That's the relevant underlying law. But the very fact that this statute put together English and Roman Dutch law suggests that there was still some overlap in the public mind between the two. The Roman Dutch law of treason was in fact much more extensive and much more vague than the 1351 Act. It was based on the Roman uh, Lex Iulia on treason, the crime committed against the Roman people or against their safety. And what the law meant was discussed and explained in a series of early modern writers who didn't necessarily agree on its ambit. The Roman crimen peduelionis was the offence akin to the English law of treason. Jurists defined it as involving a hostile intent or acting in the manner of enemies towards the state. It embraced both actions in support of external enemies of the state and those which sought to undermine sovereign authority internally. Some writers uh, saw uh, the latter kind of treason, the internal treason, as aimed at overthrowing the established authorities. Others spoke in vaguer terms of endangerment, which might include even preparatory acts. In van der Linden's uh, rather general definition, this crime is committed by those who, with a hostile intention, disturb, injure, or endanger the independence or security of the state. In contrast to English law, the offence was committed against the state or the government rather than the person of the sovereign. And in the view of some writers, it might even be committed against an entity such as the Dutch East India Company. If there was a certain ambiguity about the nature of the law of treason uh, in the British South African colonies in the 19th century, uh, the cases which arose during uh, the Anglo-Boer War shed further light on the subject. Cases arising from the war confirmed once again that the English colonies were, uh, the British colonies were able to depart from metropolitan rules. Uh, in 1902, uh, the case of Jan Lodewijk Marais uh, came to the Privy Council, which confirmed not only that there could be different procedures in the colonies, but that the substantive law might also diverge from the metropolitan model. Marek uh, challenged his conviction for treason by a special court set up in Natal uh, under legislation passed in 1900, which had been passed to um, allow for the expedited trials of rebels charged with high treason without a jury. The act defined treason very broadly. When the court was set up, the colonial judge Sir William Smith was appointed president of the court uh, because of his experience in Roman Dutch law. He'd been a judge in British Guyana, so they moved him around to Natal as somebody with experience in Roman Dutch law. Ironically enough, because British Guyana was one of those colonies that, that in mid-century replaced its Roman Dutch criminal law with English criminal law. So he didn't have any experience of Roman Dutch criminal law anyway. Having been convicted by Smith's court of aiding and assisting the enemy, Maria uh, appealed to the Privy Council where he sought to challenge the right of the special court to try him under the Natal law relating to treason. Arguing on his behalf, Lord Coleridge stated that he had the right to be tried by a jury under English law. He claimed that the original settlers in Natal had carried with them the law of England, which included trial by jury, and that it was not in the power of the local legislature to pass legislation repugnant to such an important law. Uh, he also challenged the uh, validity 
of Section 4 of the um, uh, 1868 Treason Felony Act. And he concluded that it was an extraordinary thing to say that they could have one law of treason in one colony and another law of treason in another colony. Lord Chancellor Holsbury was unmoved. In his view, the Colonial Laws Validity Act of 1865 had given the colony the very power to uh, change its laws uh, from the English rule. It was perfectly open to a colony to have a law of treason, which was distinct not only procedurally, but also substantively from that of the mother country. If this was to accept that the local substantive law of treason might diverge from the English model, local judges were often keen to stress the similarity of the English law uh, to, uh, to Roman Dutch. Uh, and we can see this from the statement of Justice Finnemore uh, in a case that came to the Natal the Supreme Court before the Special Court was created, where he said, there's very little difference between the law of this colony and the law of England as to high treason. The law of England corresponds to a considerable extent with Roman law upon which our Roman Dutch law is based so that both the English law and the Natal law have the same origin. Whereas there was little, uh, so what we can see from this is there is therefore a kind of route into English law from the learning applied in Roman Dutch law. If you think there's enough overlap, there might be a kind of uh, cross influence. And whereas there was little authority in English law as to what counted as giving aid and comfort to the king's enemies, under the 1351 Act, there was a great deal of discussion of that in the Roman law texts. Uh, for example, um, Roman Dutch writers explained that it was treason to give money to the enemy, uh, to lend money to the enemy, even if your motive was private gain. It was not treason to give them luxuries because luxuries were not of any use in war, uh, but anything that was not luxurious, you could give. It's good to give them wine, they'll get drunk um, and they won't fight, bad to give them money. Jurists also debated other knotty questions such as whether it would be treason in the wife of a rebel to feed him. Uh, is she a traitor or not? Is she giving aid and comfort to the enemy? The special court in Natal had the opportunity to explain, explore in detail what counted as aiding the enemy in dealing with a raft of cases which arose from the Boer invasion of northern Natal at the end of 1899, uh, when much of the region, including the towns of uh, Newcastle and Dundee, were occupied for more than seven months. In many of the cases, the court had to consider activities by defendants which did not involve uh, bearing arms. Uh, for example, uh, John William Gowthorpe was accused of uh, supplying the occupiers from his chemist's store. Uh, that was one count of uh, entertaining the Boer general Joubert at his home uh, and thirdly of volunteering to help uh, police in Newcastle to protect property, including his own, on four occasions. In deciding this case, uh, Smith drew on Roman Dutch ideas of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Uh, the first two did not count as treason, the last one did, and so he was convicted. The last one was treason because if he hadn't um, acted as a policeman, the, the troops would have had to do the policing, so he was indirectly helping them. Those charged with uh, treason for joining the enemy or assisting it in various ways during this time often claimed that once the area had been taken over by the Boer authorities, their allegiance to a British sovereign no longer capable of protecting them was dissolved, and they could therefore not be accused of treason for aiding the enemy. Under English law, although the bond between a natural born subject and their sovereign was meant to be a personal one, which could not be severed even if the territory fell into foreign hands, legislation dating from the reign of Henry VII appeared to offer a defense since it provided that no one should be tried for treason for serving a de facto king in wartime. In the Natal cases, defendants who sought to invoke this argument, including uh, J.L. Murray before the Privy Council, failed with those arguments. English law also recognized that those who were not natural born subjects did not owe a lifelong allegiance, but only a local allegiance during their time of residence. And some defendants who are not natural born subjects therefore said that once the Boer forces had taken over Northern Natal, the local allegiance to the British fell away because they were no longer protecting them in any way. These arguments also failed to persuade the court. Uh, Johannes Prozetsky, uh, a German citizen, uh, whose uh, assistance took the form of acting as a magistrate, um, 
failed with that argument. Uh, Sir William Smith, commenting on the English arguments that were deployed, de deployed in the case, said uh, that the doctrine of some of the English cases that a foreigner comes with, uh, that a foreigner owes a local allegiance by a sort of quasi contract in return for the protection afforded to him was, as he put it, neither logical nor consistent with our law. To say that might be English, but it's not ours. If this was to suggest that the Roman Dutch law relating to such questions differed from the English, the Privy Council later confirmed in his case that the uh, English law did in fact take exactly the same view. Uh, five years at the end of the war, um, uh, Ludovic de Jager appeal, uh, appealed against his conviction for treason, uh, which had ended both in a five-year prison sentence, which he'd served by then, but also a £5,000 fine, a very large fine that he wanted to recover. Uh, Diago was a burgher of the South African Republic, but had lived for 10 years in Natal. Uh, in the Privy Council, Sir Robert Finlay argued that although a British subject owed allegiance to his sovereign the world over, a foreigner's tie, uh, a foreigner's only tie was the protection he enjoyed under the British crown, and that when that ceased, uh, ceased he was within his rights to join the forces of his native country. The argument failed yet again, but instead of stating that the matter was settled by Roman Dutch law, Lord Lerben Ler uh, held it is old law that an alien resident within British territory owes allegiance to the crown and may be indicted for high treason, though not a subject. He added that the protection uh, of a state does not cease merely because the state forces, for strategic or other reasons, are temporarily withdrawn so that the enemy for the time exer uh, exercises the rights of an army in, in occupation. The Privy Council's decision did not rest only on this rather thin examination of the English law of allegiance, but was also informed by a general argument that uh, it would be intolerable in the modern age if uh, resident aliens were free to take up arms to support an invading force. But on this occasion, when elaborating the English substantive law of treason or explaining it, the Privy Council was prepared to read the English law in the light uh, in, has been consistent with the Roman Dutch cases that had come through the South African uh, courts. So to move to uh, conclusion, the enemy, uh, the, the empire rather, uh, contained a variety of treason laws ranging from the 1351 statute through variants of the 1848 Treason Felony Act to local provisions such as the Indian codes influenced by uh, uh, introduced by legislation or Roman Dutch law inherited from earlier ru rulers. Both English and colonial law gave considerable scope for the authorities to prosecute those who'd taken, arms, taken up arms against the crown and had given any kind of aid and assistance to its enemies uh, anywhere outside the realm. Rather than being narrow and inflexible, imperial treason law could be expansive. As the Boer War cases showed, the law of treason could have both a metropolitan and a local dimension. The Crown could prosecute the same offence in different places with different results. Arthur Lynch, who joined the Boer forces in Northern Natal, was tried in London as a traitor under the 1351 Act, as we've seen, since the treason law had imperial reach, and was given the death sentence. But the rebels who were tried in Natal under the Roman Dutch law and convicted uh, were given very much lighter sentences. John Galthorpe, who I mentioned before, was fined 20 pounds, uh, rather lesser penalty. In England, the use of the charge of treason remained uh, restrained. The 1351 Act continued to be used for wartime treasons, while the 1848 one was used for domestic forms of terrorism. Outside of India, uh, of England rather, notably in India and South Africa, the notion of what constituted warfare or giving aid to enemies expanded. While these were clearly distinct jurisdictions, it was not so clear that the boundaries between them were always impermeable. There might in effect be little to stop judges in London interpreting the meaning of giving aid and comfort under the 1351 Act as generously as the South African judges interpreted Perduelio. The fact that they did not was not a matter of law, but a matter of context, opportunity and need. Uh, it was not the law itself which was restrained, uh, but its use. Uh, 
In 2019, Home Secretary, uh, then Home Secretary Sajid Javid, uh, asked his officials to look into updating the old offence of treason in a way which would help us to counter hostile state activity. This appeared to be premised on the view that the law of treason is narrow, inflexible and unusable. A closer examination of the history and uses of the statutes still in place must, might make us pause before we think we need a new and tougher law of treason. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lobin, for a fascinating and engaging presentation. Uh, we'll now take questions from those attending both in person and virtually. If those attending virtually wouldn't mind raising their virtual hand, that would be... <coughs> <clears throat> I wonder how far all of this represents juristic thought or jurisprudence, how far it is simply policy. That's a, a tricky question. The, the, the application of it is clearly political because it's the choice of whether whether to prosecute or not. So the, the, the ranges within you, 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 within which you make those, those uh, choices. Um, there's a lot of juridical thought in the sense that um, the commissioners who are trying to kind of narrow down the um, the use of constructive treasons, uh, although they don't get um, the code, that's often uh, a question of of even legislative luck. I mean, Stevens, um, 1879, 1880, attempt to codify just falls for other kinds of political reasons. So it may be that um, political decisions not to use those statutes are also informed by what is considered to be juridically possible. I suspect in India, the expansion of the use of, uh, uh, of Section 121 uh, in the late 19th and particularly early 20th century is to some degree made possible by jurists saying you can still do this with this with the act um, uh, and that a narrow version might uh, might you know, in India you, you presumably as, as they did in 1909 you could just pass other legislation to make it possible they don't need to because jurists say you can use this particular particular statute so I guess the answer would be it's a, it's a combination of both but it's not simply politics it's also the juridical background thanks thanks for that Um, you mentioned something in a Canadian case about the judge comparing Canadian laws and uh, laws in India and they talked about uh, uh, the laws in Africa. I was wondering if you saw other kind of parallel developments or other instances where they were looking at um, within colonies and expand the region. So it's, it's not, I mean, you see it most, um, most strikingly in the South African cases where Council are bringing in arguments from English law, and one of the reasons for that is is the ambiguity until the late 19th century as to what exactly um, the local criminal law is. Uh, it winds up being Roman Dutch, but but heavily influenced by 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 English law. So often, council have the idea that well, treason is treason, and, and often in the charges, it could be a charge under under Roman Dutch law, it could be a charge under English law. You don't, they don't actually say, you know, under this section of it, they just use formulae which look English, but are also consistent with the, the Roman Dutch definitions. And then you just chuck in every argument you can. Um, and sometimes uh, the judges come back and say, well, if you look at it this way or that way, it's the, it's the same result. So there's this kind of um, mixture there. The Canadian, the, the real case is, is kind of curious. I'm not quite sure why Halsbury makes that remark. And uh, it's doubly puzzling because he says this precise power has been used in India. And yet, as far as I can see, it hasn't. Um, I'm not sure what he's thinking of exactly. Similar things are used, but the exact parallel isn't there. He just thinks it is. Um, what's, what's interesting there, though, is, his, is he is thinking of the part of the empire which at that stage has made the biggest departures. And so he's saying uh, the constitutional position of what can be done in India is exactly the same as in as in Canada. And of course, the background history is, 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 is quite, quite strikingly different. Um, 
uh, and then of course you i mean the curious thing is you get the you get the, co the the attempted codification in england first uh and then the codification in india which is very influenced by the english thing and then in turn it kind of influences elsewhere but one curious distinction is when stephen puts in his code he codifies the 1351 act and then that's of course adopted in various places in in uh, uh in Australia and Queensland and Canada and in other places. Um, and it includes all the provisions about protecting the person of the king. It doesn't include the, you know, um, violating the eldest daughter of the king and that kind of stuff. Those those get left out, but the others get put in. And it's one of those curious things that um, I think none of that gets put in in India because when they're drafting the code, they think, well, the sovereign is never going to come to India, right? Um, Whereas they're clearly th thinking the sovereign may come to Canada and they may come to uh, to Australia. Um, and the irony is, of course, the sovereign's first trip uh, to India uh, predates the sovereign's first trip either to Canada or Australia by quite a bit. So, in fact, you know, um, it's just it's not regarded as, uh, as as a thing. But the kind of psychology might be the difference between a settler colony and a non-settler colony that you have this kind of personal allegiance in a settler colony that they don't think is relevant in in, in that other one but otherwise there's this kind of mingling but th thanks thanks for the question yeah. uh, Joe, sorry, and Chris, um, but, um, I was just thinking because um, there are some echoes in some of the later cases you're talking about in which um, there are at least attempts to kind of expand um, the statute to cover um, attacks on the sort of political character of the king um, in addition to the personal one. And also because it is, it is also a kind of um, an interesting case in the sense that the acts that are alleged to be treasonable um, take out place outside of England, but um, does, does, the, does the attempt to sort of um, impeach and then successfully to attain Stratford and the King Court is people touch that at all, or is that just sort of ignored? Because that's something you know, that's a great controversy at the time where people, many people feel that to be sort of unwarrantable, um, and certainly it's a very novel attempt to expand um, the remit of the statute. Mm -hmm. um, and even some people argue that this actually is a common law treason. So, um, but is, is this something that people touch at a, a later date? I was just thinking that you know, the charge and the running corresponding to side and try, you know, I was trying to subvert the legislature. It seems similar. So, yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Well, uh, attainder and uh, statutes, uh, you, you get statutes throughout the empire in this period to imprison people. Uh, but often yeah, it is it is a statute. There is no trial. That's regarded as completely separate from from treason trials. So things like attender, acts of attainder yes. or impeachment uh, don't get into that dialogue at all. But but they do um, uh, they do pass those kinds of equivalent things. And there are other areas that I've talked about in in terms of conspiracy and sedition, where there there are other kind of parallels going on. Uh, in terms of what's happening in 1794, so it's a curious thing. I mean. Um, it's really the attempt to use treason against an entire political movement. Uh, and all of the overt acts are acts of, of politics. Now, it seems to me, I think the Crown, the Crown's lawyers, um, John Scott, Lord Eldon is, is, is one of them. I think they, they think this may wind up with George III in the guillotine. Uh, this is how it started in France. and. So it's not it's not a cynical move. Let's break the the movement by using treason. They're thinking that the the terminus ad quem is actually he's going to die. And the other side is saying no, no, not at all. That just doesn't doesn't work when it gets through the the the, 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 the trial argument. So, but it is um, it is a constructive treason in the sense that there is no plot of any kind against the king's life. Um, and uh, it is such a stretch. Um, it's not a stretch in the imagination, but in the proof and in the argument, it, it, it is a kind of stretch. And it means that the next time, I think the next real equivalent mass political trial 
would be the, the trial of Fergus O'Connor and 43 others in 1842 around the Chartist movement, the plot, plot trials and so on. And there the charge is seditious conspiracy. Nobody thinks of using treason uh, uh, at all there. They use treason against the Chartists, but when there's rebellion, the Newport Rising of, of 1839, by then they're not using that uh, treason at all. But the, the 1794 thing is, um, is the kind of high point for con constructive treason. Although, as I said, the idea, the idea remains legally respectable um, and is repeated in the early 19th century, but not used. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Um, it sounds like the allegiance um, and protection um, uh, reciprocity issue is really fascinating. And, and it, I think you suggested that the sources you have actually um, include defenses of, of uh, colonized people kind of stating protection hadn't been offered to them, therefore they couldn't offer allegiance. Is that, is that accurate? And, yeah, I mean, they they try those arguments, and the the interesting thing is, and they they try the arguments uh, both in 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 India and and in South Africa, um, and it's curious because the defendants there are using the English language of of treason because the personal allegiance is not part of the, the Roman uh, Dutch idea. It's about loyalty to the state. But here they're talking about that kind of personal bond of, of loyalty and, uh, and allegiance. Uh, and, and as I said, in, in India, it's offences against the state. The queen is put in. Uh, the queen isn't there in Macaulay's draft because she's not queen, but in 1860 she is. But it's not kind of functionally important in, 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 in that statute. But then the defendants bring it in and say, this is the whole. So they're trying to say there's an imperial idea of loyalty, which underpins the whole notion of treason. And the curious thing is there, the judges are saying, no, it isn't. It doesn't kind of count in this in this context. And then the curious thing is, and again, how, how important is, is allegiance when you get home? Because then when these cases come to the Privy Council and then they're beginning to explain it in English terms, they're saying, well, actually, the argument isn't going to run because the protection hasn't been withdrawn. Um, we may not be around, but you know it's kind of implicit protection, and therefore the allegiance carries on. Or, or the idea that um, uh, the allegiance is is permanent, um, or even the idea that older older case law to do with obeying the de facto king no longer applies in the modern age, as if to say we're moving it away from treason being a personal allegiance to a notion of the state, uh, but still trying to maintain the old language. Uh, we actually have a question from someone online. Uh, Tony asks, thank you for your intensive and insightful lecture. Here's a simple question. Edmund Burke once said in the 18th century that Indian people had their own Magna Charta to justify the rule of AIC in another way, EIC in another way. In terms of treason, did any British lawyer or politician in the 19th century defend Indian people or other uncivilized people based on their constructive basic right? Uh, that's a, uh, an interesting question. Um, I mean, you do have a lot of um, debate about <clears throat> rule in India and, and, and rights, but to, to, to get that onto a specifically legal thing, um, I'm, I struggle to find uh, that kind of general argument. I mean, the Magna Carta argument is made quite a lot uh, in various mid-century cases and, and later cases, but and it's a kind of basic right that is associated with those uh, British rights. So it's not a, a more abstract thing. It's trying to use the English uh, rights, um, and that's used also in other parts of the empire. But the curious thing about using Magna Carta as a, as a legal defense is you're pretty much always on a losing wicket when you pull that one out, uh, largely because of things like the Colonial Laws Validity Act or the, or the very argument the uh, Indian Penal Code is is sidestepping Magna Carta. It's another kind of statute or, or, or a local statute. So what tends to happen is in lots of cases, you will get um, more general arguments uh, and often um, 
arguments that are not just general on rights, but more focused on those ancient English statutes. Um, but they're they're really successful. Yeah. But thank you for the question. I, I need to think more about that as well. Um, can I ask about um, what happened after Empire? In the sense that we're often told that post-colonial societies have uh, residual elements of, of common law in them. Um, is this true for treason or not? Because of course, the treason law is still based on monarchs who might or might not be. <coughs> Heads of state. Um, so, is, is this? Uh, I noticed that your story, as it moved to contemporary times, of course, became a British story with the Home Secretary. Um, to what extent is is this legacy? Is this a leg? Is this a legacy around the world of how treason uh, is conceived, or is it that um, because all states need a concept of treason, that actually this this has become, in the end, with the contraction of empire, the meaning of this has contracted to to a purely insular. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think in, in a lot of, uh, so I, I, I wouldn't uh, um, uh, pretend to talk about all of the different parts of the empire because lots of former colonies have revised laws in various ways. But I think, for example, of South African India, so the Indian Penal Code is still the basic law um, and Section 121 is still the act and there have been relatively recent cases using that. And if you look at Indian uh, criminal law textbooks, you get a lot of discussion about the meaning of levying war under the 1351 statute, even contemporary things. So that genealogy is, 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 is still there. And in many of these <clears throat> jurisdictions, the um, late colonial application of the law, which was often very authoritarian, didn't get removed after decolonization. So there's still a kind of authoritarian version of uh, an originally English law uh, in place. Uh, and in South Africa, um, uh, the Roman Dutch law is still the basis of it. So then you had, you've had various curious cases in the 1930s and beyond where, when before South Africa became a republic and the crown is still there, um, does it really have to be aimed against the crown, uh, or is it uh, is South, is the Union of South Africa its own state with its own maestas? And they say yes, it is, and therefore you know you can you can have treason in a slightly more abstract way than um, than had been the case before when you have a charge you know, against against the crown. But in many ways, I think yeah, these these pieces of legislation are still the foundation in many countries. Although of course the way they've dealt with them will reflect their own local circumstances. Thanks. I uh, had a uh, single professor uh, such a few The first one is like, uh, how do you suggest foundation of the trees and all? Has to do with like the early modern just foundational resort state. That this uh, uh, concept of state come into the place and type of transfer of the crown or that the whole trees and all is all about the person in the physical body. And the second question would be like, uh, I'm thinking about whether colonial law that it, it, it is something created a really similar situation of martial law, or what's the distinction between like creating martial law situation and colonial law uh, just like standing there? And then, and also like reflecting on something like Daisy's here, there's no martial law, it's like legally, or it's like, it's like in, in real legal situation there it is, but it's like legally whether it's legitimate to have martial law in the whole English common law tradition and that has to do with like formal question about like British law, whether it reached to the common places. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, very, very good question. So the, the reason of state uh, uh, idea, which I guess is a kind of idea of prerogative powers, powers that do not derive from any uh, specific instrument of of statute and are not implicit in the common law, but are these exceptional powers, um, uh, which I guess would be most seen in practice with things like martial law declarations. I found very little um, specific mention of reason of state in, in 19th century discussions. One area where you do get it is the 1818 Bengal regulation, where they do talk about needing to detain people for reasons of state or for reason of state. And that does get in there in the in the Indian um, 
legislation in the early 19th century. But elsewhere, it's not really a phrase that's used very much. It's much more around um, the debates of, of martial law, which uh, um, which uh, you, you, you mentioned there. Uh, and of course, there's a very large amount of debate about that um, around the time of the Jamaica Rebellion, uh, the Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865, which as Randy Costell shows was sort of inconclusive in the end. They weren't, you know, Dicey has this view that um, there is no such thing as martial law, it's all to be tested by the common law. And then the rival view, Finlayson's view, which is that it's all part of prerogative. In the Boer War, these debates are rehashed again. And interestingly, the um, the military are still saying there are these prerogative powers. You still have voices within the military saying, and military lawyers saying. And one of the most extraordinary things I found in, in earlier work is uh, even Lord Halsbury, who himself gives a law officer's opinion in 1878, which is Dicean, privately tells the military in 1900, no, no, you can, you can do it. You've got prerogative powers to do this, in my view. And, uh, so it, it still remains uh, kind of an open question. And that's settled in a way by some important Privy Council cases that, that say when you have a state of war, the courts have no jurisdiction. They do have jurisdiction afterwards, but if you pass an indemnity act, which is always done, it closes the question. So you get a kind of legalized reason of state, if you, if you like, um, uh, coming through that way. Uh, but another, uh, the other curious thing is what what is law in the empire? So as I mentioned, the um, there is often a concern as to where the, <clears throat> where English statutes work, the Colonial Laws Validity Act. Um, the idea of that is a statute only applies in a colony if the colony is meant to be covered by it, if it's specifically named uh, uh, usually. So you have absurd cases um, in the early 20th century where people try to raise Magna Carta uh, or the Star Chamber Act of uh, 1641. And the judges say, well, you know, Betuan land wasn't mentioned in those statutes. <laughs> surprise, surprise, you know, <laughs> who would have thought? Um, and arguments to say, well, it must have been, it's so important, it must have been for everywhere. Don't, don't get very far. So then you begin to get the idea was, you then need to legislate for every single colony, which may explain what I can't otherwise explain, why in 1867 the, does the colonial office say to everybody, pass the Treaty and Felony Act? So this is two years after the Colonial Laws Validity Act. Maybe they're thinking the Treaty and Felony Act doesn't apply imperially. But then you have Castillo's trial, and the Treaty and Felony Act was never passed in British Honduras. Uh, there is no local act. They just prosecute him under the, in, in the, under the British Act, under the Imperial Act. Nobody at the Colonial Office says you can't do this. They, it's this kind of ambiguous world. Maybe it applies, maybe it doesn't. We, we won't worry about it, you know, unless somebody asks and nobody's going to ask. So you have this kind of ambiguity uh, uh, throughout. Okay, well, we might wrap it up there. Uh, those here, please do join us at the Grand Up for some drinks. And please join me once again in thanking Professor Robin. Thank you.